Yeah, I'm very honored to uh, to talk today about the the time that we spend uh, trying to correct statistical and design errors in published research. Um, so I'll cover some of our experiences and how they relate to considerations for doing meta research on the topic. So just a couple uh, quick disclosures and a note that uh, this work is a collaboration with a lot of different people, including those you see here, but also many others. Uh, David Allison and Andrew Brown in particular have worked in this area for at least a decade. Uh, and others listed here have led or worked on many letters to the editor or provided key statistical support on them. Uh, and you know, shout out in particular to David Allison, who's found really clever ways to get funding so we can formally dedicate effort to this, uh, to this work. So in this talk, I'll discuss some examples of errors in scientific papers, our experiences trying to correct errors, because I think these experiences uh, may help in a couple ways. Um, one, they may inspire hopefully new research questions related to what I'll talk about. And two, it may help to illuminate some of the considerations when coming up with a research question or the challenges that you may face depending on the approach you take. And third, I'll briefly discuss a few meta research projects that I'm involved in uh, related to errors and some additional considerations when doing this work. So first, we will start out by asking, is this even a problem? How common are errors in science? And so there are too many types of errors to go over uh, in this talk. So I'm just going to take a few slides to quickly run through some examples of the range of types of different errors inside in scientific articles that you might encounter. Um, so on this slide, the first types of error, the first type of errors that can be detected just by looking at summary data reported in papers. Um, and so the first example here in psychology, about 2% of p-values were estimated to be inconsistent with their test statistics and degrees of freedom. Uh, and this work was uh, found using the automated screening uh, of the literature by a tool called StatCheck, um, which you can run on your own. Uh, and it looks for um, you know, summary statistics reported in APA format. And you see the example on the slide there. Um, another survey um, looked uh, found that over 20% of a sample of psychological papers have more than one inconsistency with the sample size and mean values of integer-based data with the corresponding sample size. Uh, and this, this was called the, the GRIM test or the granularity related inconsistency of means test. And then the last one, the last example here is about five to 8% of published p-values were inconsistent with from their ratios and reported confidence intervals from uh, a sample of, of Medline abstracts. And so each of these surveys show that, um, you know, simple inconsistencies in summary data are not uncommon in published science. Um, you know, the errors could simply be typos, miscalculations, or not fully reporting, you know, a number of participants or other information. Um, but uh, they're errors nonetheless. And you can see there's really a big range for these depending on what you, what and how you survey. Another example, uh, so this is a, an example of a, a statistical analysis error. Uh, this particular error is the result of doing within group testing to generate a p-value for each group that you test, and then directly comparing those different p-values to determine uh, you know, if you have a, a evidence of an effect. Um, and so instead, you, you want to do a direct between group comparison uh, and generate one p-value. And I won't go into the details on why this is an error, but uh, it does inflate type one error uh, and can lead to mis misleading conclusions. Um, and so, you know, a few surveys have found that, you know, this is not uncommon in, in scientific articles. The first one looked at 161 trials, found that 10% reported this within group comparison only instead of the correct between group comparison. Um, the second survey looked at neuroscience articles in five top ranking journals 
and found that 15% use the incorrect procedure. And alarmingly, this uh, last article found that 46% of articles with claims of sex-specific effects reported the effect of treatment within each sex instead of doing that appropriate between group uh, comparison. And another example of a, a statistical error, this is also one that we commonly see uh, in, in our discipline, uh, which is errors in cluster randomized controlled trials. So um, if you randomize groups of, of participants instead of individuals, um, then you have to account for that clustering and nesting in the analysis. And so here's a, a survey of school-based studies addressing weight that was done uh, a few years back now and found that only 21.5% accounted for clustering in the power analysis and only 68.6% did their final, ana final analysis correctly to account for clustering. So essentially a, a third of publications in this area are not doing the analysis correctly. So how common are other types of errors? Um, you know, a couple other examples are um, errors in published nucle nucleotide sequence uh, sequences. So uh, nucleotide sequence reagents that are required for various lab techniques such as uh, PCR or gene knockdown um, are also often also not correct as published. Uh, many don't match the corresponding sequence they claim to be matching. Um, and then also on the right, there are a lot of image duplications um, that one can find. So in this particular survey uh, by Elizabeth Bick, who's really good at, at spotting these, um, found that about 6% of the articles in this journal in this time frame from 2009 to 2016 were deemed to contain inappropriately duplicated images. And just as an example of what these look like, you can see the colored boxes are um, kind of the same pattern uh, if you look closely um, in the microscopy and also in the blot. So, um, you know, Western blots uh, are, you know, and microscopy are seem to be common sources of this type of, of error. The errors that our particular uh, research group um, is most interested in that we focus on are related to the design and analysis of randomized trials such as improper implementation of randomization when studies are reported as randomized, improper analysis of randomized experiments, especially errors related to cluster randomized trials, um, such as, you know, as I previously explained, not accounting for clustering and nesting when groups are allocated instead of the individuals. Um, those within group, uh, within group errors instead of between group, which we call the DINs error, the difference in nominal significance error. Um, sometimes we observe undisclosed outcome switching, inconsistent summary data throughout papers and, and so on. Um, and so going into each error itself would um, take a little bit too long. So he, I've just put some review articles that our group has written that cover some of these errors in different contexts and um, you know, are on the slide for more background. So we, our group focuses on what we call unequivocal or, or invalidating errors. Um, in other words, not matters of opinion. Um, and just to read these quotes, um, by errors we mean actions or conclusions that are demonstrably or unequivocally incorrect from a logical or epistemological point of view, such as logical fallacies, mathematical mistakes, statements not supported by the data, incorrect statistical procedures, or analyzing the wrong data set. Um, and in validating errors, you know, we mean those that involve factual mistakes or veer substantially from clearly accepted procedures in ways that, if corrected, they may alter a paper's conclusions. Um, and so we usually, but not exclusively, focus on clinical trials. All right, so not, next I'm going to go through a little bit about our experiences trying to correct errors in published papers. So if, if you set out to study errors in science and want to be prepared to design a study on a particular question, I think it really helps to have some context about the different routes of error correction uh, that, that are available. And so there, 
are many different things you could choose to do if you find a published error in a paper. The first is that you could ignore it. Um, you know, this is hard to do, but given the volume of errors in published papers, sometimes it is the reasonable option if you think that correcting it may not change the interpretation of the results of the paper, or maybe you gauge that the paper may not be very influential in your, in your field anyway. Um, another option that you could do a quick post about it on pubpeer.com, which is a platform that allows you to link post-publication commentary to any article with the DOI. Uh, and then you, you can flag it for others who may check PubPeer as they're reading scientific papers. You could also try posting about it on social media and take the journal or publisher and hope they see it and handle it that way, which does work for some people uh, <clears throat> and has worked in at least one case when I, uh, when I did it. And you could also email an editor at the journal and report it and then be done with it, hoping that they'll take it seriously, they'll keep it on their plate, uh, and eventually it'll be corrected. Or you could choose a more persistent route uh, and try to work the editorial system to try to achieve some sort of resolution and correction by submitting a formal or informal letter to the editor and following up. Um, and I'd say most journals allow formal editors to be submitted, although some are very restrictive on word and author limits or the length of time from when a paper was published that you can submit a letter. Um, but we almost always take this latter approach to work the editorial system, both as a way to attempt to get errors flagged as closely to the original paper as possible um, you know, via a linked letter to the editor or ideally a correction or retraction, and also to challenge the editorial process to develop procedures to handle invalidating errors if they haven't uh, you know, had to do this before. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite articles um, about how to publish a, a scientific content, a comment or a letter is, is published by uh, Professor Rick Trebino. Um, and he outlined this, this easy one, two, three easy steps process um, where first you read a paper that have, has a mistake in it. First, you write and submit a comment, politely correcting the mistake. And three, you enjoy your comment in print along with the author's equally polite reply, basking in the joy that you've participated in the glorious scientific process and of the new friends you've made. And then he goes on to say, you didn't really believe that, did you? And he walks through the, the actual sequence of events where instead of one, two, three easy steps, it's actually 123 steps. Um, and at the, the, the very end, he says, you know, this scenario actually occurred as written and that he even left out some of the steps. Um, and so it, unfortunately, this is um, more realistic, more along the lines of what we sometimes observe when trying to do this is um, there's just many steps, many barriers uh, in the process. And so I, I put together kind of a general flow chart based on my observations from about 25 published letters that I've been a part of uh, and many more that our group has worked on over the years. And this really reflects a loose representation about different ways that post-publication corrections can go. Uh, it's certainly not exhaustive because each experience we have is often unique and some you know often will throw us a curveball that we have to adapt to and uh, and explore different uh, new options. But you know to start the flow chart, this is really the ideal process that you know if it went this way every time, um, that would just be you know ideal. So we we would email the authors request de-identified data. The authors would share their code. Uh, share their data and ideally their code. We would reanalyze their data. We would, you know, we could confirm that there's an error um, if we flag one from just reading the article and we could correct the error and we could publish a joint correction with the authors. And so we've actually gone through this process several times um, with author groups um, who have been very polite and collegial um, and you know, it's worked out great. Everyone has a joint, you know, publication at the end. 
Um, no one's getting, you know, no one's getting punished. We're fulfilling the self, the ideals of, of science is self-correcting. Um, and we're acknowledging that honest mistakes, honest errors happen. Uh, we're all human uh, and everyone goes goes on um, and, and errors fixed, fixed in science. But unfortunately, um, you know, the flowchart gets a lot more complicated once, <laughs> Uh, you know, this is the minority of cases that we actually get to work with original authors um, and publish something together. Um, so it often goes in very different ways. Often we'll, sometimes we'll get uh, raw data from investigators, we'll reanalyze it, and then we'll submit a letter ourselves with our group. Um, and from there, you know, the letter may have several different outcomes. Um, ideally, a correction or retraction of, of the original article would happen. Um, but, you know, I'd say that's a minority of cases in our experience. Um, often we run up to some barriers such as there's an author response to our letter, but the journal just declines to correct the original article, which is not, not ideal because, um, you know, when, when published letters, uh, when letters are published, they're um, sometimes but not always linked to the original article. Um, and even if they are linked, it's just a generic, you know, here's a, a letter to the editor published with this paper. And it doesn't tell you anything about the severity uh, of the, you know, or the content of that letter and the potential severity of the, of the error that a letter might be reporting. And so unless a reader is really digging in, really looking for these post-publication uh, comments, um, you know, they're really difficult to find. An another outcome may be no response from the authors at all. So maybe our letter will get published, but that's it. Uh, it's just done there. Um, or our, sometimes our letter just gets rejected for various reasons. Um, and then we spend a lot of time appealing to you know, both editors in chief, um, or sometimes we contact the Committee on Publication Ethics, COPE, uh, if we think that you know, proper procedures are not being followed by the journal. Um, and over the years, we've kind of come up with some language that uh, seems to be pretty effective at getting the attention of editors, you know, appealing that this is, these are invalidating errors that need to be corrected. They're not just the typical uh, you know, post-publication commentary that may be more differences of opinion and so on. Um, other outcomes may be that when we email authors to request data, they may decline to share data. Um, you know, then we'll often email the editor in chief. Uh, this is where journal data sharing policies uh, are really helpful. If the journal has a, a policy, we can customize that email and request that the editor intervene and uh, enforce that policy. Um, and in some cases, they do. They, they will email the, the authors and com you know, compel them to share data or at least request that they share data. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes the editors themselves decline to enforce their own data sharing policies, um, which is you know, frustrating. but. Um, so from those points, if we get stuck and we can't get raw data, we'll often just jump to submitting submitting the letter to the editor describing our concerns, um, but that we couldn't obtain the raw data to uh, you know to verify that way through reanalysis. Um, and a lot of the times we email authors, they don't reply. Um, we'll send lots of follow-ups again, try to involve the editor. Um, you know if the Sometimes editors don't reply in a timely manner or stop replying after a while. Um, and eventually we sometimes involving COPE um, helps in these cases just to get things going. Uh, COPE can't actually enforce anything, but just sometimes an email from COPE to a journal um, may prompt them to reply again. So it, as you can see, this, this process, um, and this is just kind of a, a a simplified process. It's really hard to standardize this, um, which I think is a really interesting thing to study in itself. But 
if you're designing a study with the purpose of trying to get raw data and to reanalyze studies, you want to think carefully about how you're going to deal with you know, some of these barrier, barriers in a timely manner. And if errors are corrected at all, it can take a long time for that to happen. So here are a couple anecdotes by two different research teams who experienced that journal response times varied from two to 30 months in this case to address nucleotide sequence errors. And then the other case, a median of nearly two years before a correction was published. Uh, and you can see the survival curve for time to first correction in a set of papers by one author that all contain errors. Um, and a big chunk of these were not corrected when you're approaching four years in. And we experience, you know, these legs and in, uh, in corrections and uh, handling these sometimes too, even when we're very aggressive with following up with editors to request updates. Um, and so this paper was just retracted a couple weeks ago after I reported it three years and four months before. Um, and you can see on the right, there's a long list of issues with it that the journal described in the retraction notice. Um, but one of them, I thought was pretty clear cut. This is a three-arm trial where the authors publish one paper describing the results of the full trial elsewhere. And then they publish this separate paper with most of the same outcomes from just two of the three arms. Um, so it's essentially a duplicate, a duplicate publication. Uh, and this also had statistical errors in it um, and these other issues. So this particular publisher has a dedicated research integrity team to investigate errors in papers um, and, and handle them uh, in their journals. And it, it's still took them this long. And over those years, they twice sent me draft retraction notices to be sure that they were describing the issue issues correctly. And then both times they just didn't retract and many months went by without any replies to my emails. Uh, and at one point I had to resort to tracking down someone from the team through Twitter DMs just to get their attention again. Um, and so it's just a, an example of um, that often these things take persistence, patience, and knowing how to politely but firmly insist that something needs to be done uh, to get these things corrected. Uh, a, a few years ago, a group of us um, who have collectively written uh, a lot of letters. The editor published an editorial of ideals that we have for what publishing norms would make a better process to correct scientific errors. Uh, and this is sort of a minimum, but at least what I think would be relatively easily achievable list to overcome some of the barriers we encounter. Of course, to really make the process better, I think you'd need much more drastic changes to uh, editorial processes, but you know, simply distinguishing between error correction and other forms of communication, um, handling concerns concerns in a reasonable time frame, uh, and really giving us strict timelines, giving us and uh, authors that journals are corresponding with strict timelines, um, you know, to handle these concerns. Um, you know, facil helping facilitating da data sharing, um, especially when data sharing. Uh, policies at the journal uh, you know, are, exist, um, and you know, crediting those who identify or correct errors and, and so on. And others have published their wishes as well. Um, I'll just you know highlight the the first three on the left that uh, editor should issue an expression of concern within days after serious and verifiable concerns concerns have been raised. Um, that example that I discussed that it took you know over three years to correct, I requested you know several times that they put up an expression of concern or some other note on the paper while they were investigating. Um, because this that article kept being included in systematic reviews over that that long period of time. Um, and unfortunately, they just uh, declined to do that. Um, the second item, you know, COPE guidelines should provide a timeline for responding for concerns. Again, that would greatly help. Um, 
public open and post publication peer review should be considered and rewarded by hiring and promotion committees, as well as funding bodies, um, which again, I think would really help um, if we had more, more eyes looking for these types of things um, and you know, more training on how to identify them and prevent them in the first place. And the group on the right proposed a new centralized panel to oversee research integrity investigations that journals could refer cases to and heed the recommendations of this panel of experts, which I, I think would be a really good idea. Um, because we often observe that editors and journal staff don't seem to know how to handle a report of an invalidating error, um, probably because they rarely are reported and maybe they don't have the expertise to distinguish a report of a clear error from matters of opinion. Um, so I quite like this idea in principle, at least. All right, and so lastly, I'm gonna discuss some considerations for meta research in this area. Uh, I think this is a really ripe area for study. You can study errors through a variety of different angles. Um, and to simplify a discussion, you could design a study to look at you know, for example, the frequency of errors in some area, area, and I've shown some examples of studies that have done uh, just that. Although part of the reason why estimates of errors vary so widely is because they're usually done in specific journals, specific disciplines, uh, on specific topics, uh, and so only certain areas have been studied on larger biomedical corpuses. Um, and you could study barriers to correcting errors more systematically than the anecdotes I've shared here, or you could examine interventions to prevent errors. Um, some colleagues, uh, Donna Maney and Andrew Brown and I were recently awarded a, a grant to study the frequency of a uh, particular error in research that makes claims of sex differences. So this is essentially that, that within group, uh, that within group error. Uh, instead of testing bet directly between groups. Um, and so we've just started this work recently, but have already spent just a lot of time on step one, which is how do you get a general sample of biomedical research related to this question, uh, right? We want to we want to survey larger bio, uh, you know, biomedical research instead of focusing on one specific discipline. Um, and our NIH, or our National Institutes of Health in the U.S., introduced a policy requiring researchers to factor sex into design analysis and reporting of vertebrate animal studies and human studies. Um, and so we're currently exploring the use of Web of Science's categories and trying to match them as closely as possible to NIH institutes, uh, which we think would represent the types of research that are typically government funded here and of highest current priority. Uh, but it is a it is a challenge to match some of these categories closely, and you know other authors um, may come in and make different choices that we do. So we just have to make make sure that we're transparent in those choices um, and how they could potentially affect our findings. So you you could approach this question in a lot of different ways, which may alt you know, may alter your findings and your conclusions. So you could focus your sample in particular journals as others have done, which may not be representative of field overall and would restrict your conclusions to, you know, the discipline disciplines covered by those journals. You could take a random sample of all articles indexed in some database, but this would leave you with a huge number of articles to screen. Uh, to get things that are eligible. So in our case, we're looking for studies on vertebrates that include both males and females in their studies. Uh, and so this is why we're not we're not going that route because it would just give us an unreasonable uh, you know number of articles to to screen at least one reason we're not doing that. And on and on. And so you you really have to be clear about uh, what you want your conclusions to represent at the end of your study and and choose a route that's appropriate and realistic. We're, we're currently working on some projects to systematically study the computational reproducibility and verifiability of research. In other words, can you obtain raw data from authors and reanalyze it and obtain the same numbers as published in the paper following the methods that 
they report, which we call reproducibility. Um, and two, are there statistical or design errors in the papers? Uh, and this is part of verifiability. Um, and so there are a number of challenges to doing this type of work, such as a lack of responses by authors. Um, so to really generalize about the reproducibility of a particular area of research, it would be good if we could have a big sample of articles for which we can get the raw data to, to check all of them, or at least as many, you know, as many as we can. Um, but it's it's very challenging to get research groups to share raw data in the first place. Um, although the, the, the lack of response essentially renders those paper, papers irreproducible and is itself a finding. Um, and timelines can also be unpredictable. Um, some research teams will quickly share raw data. Some request a data use agreement between institutions that can take you know, weeks to months. Some require that they add your team to their IRB, which can take months. And so you need to set, a time, set aside time and resources to really roll with these and make sure you follow up regularly to keep things moving. And another issue is that some local policies don't permit data sharing out of the country. Uh, in one case, we actually sent our statisticians to another country to reproduce the paper at the author's institution using their computers because they were unable to share their data with us. And regarding interventions to prevent errors, um, I'm particularly interested in the extent that semi-automated software can assist with error prevention with the goal that you know, hopefully software can assist human reviewers eventually to flag potential errors and prevent their publication in the first place. Um, so here's a, a short demo of software I wrote that allows you to upload a PDF and it, it screens the tables looking for the baseline table in a randomized controlled trial. And it looks at the distribution of the p-values in that table. Uh, and importantly, it, it shows you what data is extracted and allows you to very quickly correct what numbers it's using to determine if something is a potential issue or not. Um, and so the, the use case here is that it can potentially flag errors related to randomization uh, in, our, in randomized controlled trials, which is really tedious to do manually. And so there, there are a lot of challenges with doing this work on the technical side before even getting to the point of doing an intervention or doing an automated survey of the literature, such as that some PDFs are malformed, table sizes and formats vary substantially. It's difficult to have a computer consistently find the right information. Um, sometimes there are extraction errors and so on. And so one thing that could affect the design of meta-research studies at the sampling and screening stage, for instance, uh, when I eventually start doing them with the software is potential differential rates of extraction success depending on differences in how disciplines report their results or how they format tables and so on. Um, and there are also concerns about you know, sending unpublished manuscripts to be read by an AI system if the AI platform doesn't have a clear policy about not using input data as future training data, which could be a barrier to implementation down the road. And there also could be risks about you know, how many and how many users will misinterpret outputs or not carefully verify results of automated systems. But I think these are all uh, prime examples of meta research questions that could be studied themselves. And so to, to summarize, errors are not uncommon. I hope I've at least convinced you of that. Um, there are many barriers to correcting errors that we've experienced through trial and error. We've developed um, we developed ways to that we think maximize our chances of at least getting to some minimum outcome of publishing a letter to at least you know flag in the system that you know, there are issues out here and hopefully readers can uh, at least some readers could find that. Um, so there's a there's a lot of work that can be done at improving the systems to facilitate more efficient, more effective uh, error correction in science. And lastly, it's it's really important to always keep the research 
your research question in mind when designing meta research on this topic, you know, as it is for any type of research. And um, this is going to influence really a myriad of decisions in what articles you sample. Uh, so in our case, you know, with research that studies sex differences, because a policy affects a huge amount of biomedical research, we want to make claims about this more general sample of bio, biomedical papers in the end. So if we find that there are a lot of errors in that sample, hopefully future policy can include guidance on how to avoid this. Whereas other types of errors may be more specific to how certain disciplines design or report research. So that may not make as much sense to sample more broadly. Um, but uh, I'm going to end it there and happy to continue the conversation in the Q&A.